Hey everyone. Um, my name is Mikhail Sana. I work for Microsoft. I'm a Linux kernel engineer, uh, specially focused on security. And this talk is uh, about uh, leveraging KVM, um, well, virtualization for security. Um, Madhavan should also be um, on the chat, so he should be able to answer questions, if any. Um, okay, so let's first start. Um, well, as you might know, um, Linux, and especially the kernel, is, uh, well, complex. And there is, of course, vulnerabilities, and, well, we need to uh, take that into account. Um, so, kernel integrity. So, we define kernel integrity with a way to protect the kernel, in this case, um, guest VM kernel. Um, so, some, some data and also its code. So, the idea is to make an attack uh, to be, well, difficult or at least costly to change uh, this data. Um, well, there's a lot of vulnerabilities, and some of them might be either exploited by uh, user space or even uh, through the network, uh, the storage or whatever. So um, the main trait here is, uh, say, as I said, um, well, an attack will be able to change kernel memory. So the guest, in this case, uh, guest kernel memory. Um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, that, well, we should, well, in this case, um, we trust the guest kernel at first because uh, the guest wants to protect itself. But trust can diminish over time. So uh, at first, uh, thanks to mechanisms like uh, Segaboot, for instance, um, well, the guest trusts itself, but over time, it might, be, uh, it might open new interfaces and then get compromised. Um, an extended strand model, so something to keep in mind, which would be interesting for future work, is, um, well, for instance, using um, protected KVM. So, um, initial PKVM, uh, the idea is to make it, to make KVM um, more uh, 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 protected from the host, so from uh, VM, from QMU, for instance. Uh, functional computing is well, something else, um, but the idea is, uh, well, for VM to not trust uh, at least too much, or at least not at all, um, the hypervisor and then the VM. So um, here we want to use and to kind of improve the kernel self protection. Uh, the, the issue with that is, uh, well, it is a self protection. So the kernel uh, can be compromised and then the attacker might be able to kind of disable these protections. So uh, we like to rely on the higher privilege component and in this case, um, the hyper KVM. Um, there's a lot of stuff which are implemented either on the canons or uh, thanks to virtualizations. Um, one of them, which is, I guess, uh, one of the oldest one, is uh, Windows uh, virtualization-based security. But there are also the implementation for, for instance, for Android with uh, Samsung AKP, uh, but also uh, on iPhone with uh, AOS. So uh, the main design here, what, what we like to, to be able to have is for guest VM to configure themselves. Um, then for KVM to be able to manage and enforce, well, to enforce um, the guest wishes on itself, guest restrictions. And then for the VMM to be able to protect uh, its resources, which is not you, and uh, to be able to react to some attacks, for instance, uh, to log them at least. Uh, from a usability point of view, um, well, we like this feature, security like feature, to be um, easy to use. Um, so we should not need um, users to uh, configure themselves such um, security feature. Um, but yeah, we like this to be well um, as simple as possible. 
and we should keep in mind that well users um anyone should be able to use their own candles and those in need to be uh well defined uh, with a clean interface and not to rely on existing um i mean not only rely on uh, hardware root of trust so to make it more flexible and to kind of uh, delegate to the hypervisor the choice to uh, use and force this transition or not. Um, so something to keep in mind, again, um, in a shell chain of trust is something like this. Uh, when you boot a machine, uh, well, you need to first trust the firmware, the bootloader, the host kernel, the VMM, and the hypervisor, and all that can uh, be done with secure boot. So, um, that is our initial trust. Then, the hypervisor can launch uh, VM. So, in this case, most simply, we need the gas kernel. And so, the hypervisor can check and verify the authenticity of this gas kernel. So, with my uh, patent to a customer. Um, so, and then, uh, the one of the goals of this kernel is to well, make user space secure, and that might include authenticate user space applications. But is it is the realm of the gas kernel, not the hypervisor. Here, we're focusing on the hypervisor, uh, trying to protect the gas kernel. There's two um, set of security policies um, we implemented. The first one is to use um, CPU registers pinning um, so uh, it is mostly to um, restrict the use of control registers, which might be used to configure uh, a kernel. Uh, for instance, to uh, enforce or not uh, wipe protections, um, smash map, and uh, this kind of security features. Um, and the important things to be able to enforce is, uh, well, protections on the guest kernel memory. So be able to, to enforce readily or even non executable kernel uh, uh, permissions uh, well, on the kernel uh, memory. Um, so, in initial, so how does it work when you want to use a virtual machine? Um, so, the VMM is in charge um, to assigning a set of memory pages to the new virtual machine then launch a VM, and then handle some VM exits, um, which might be part of the emulation process um, for devices. From a virtual machine point of view, uh, well, like any kernel, it first starts, um, creates some memory mapping, sets some permission to them. And one thing which is so interesting um, about Linux is that you can, um, at the end of the boot process, to be able to also enforce another set of permissions, of restrictions on its own uh, kernel uh, memory. So that is, in practice, the, what you can find with our um, uh, init, we know the data uh, variables. And at runtime, um, well, the kernel can also change its own memory, of course, um, and especially to be able to add new executable mappings. Um, so that's kind of the case for our kernel model loadings, uh, but also for EPPF JITs, for instance, or even if trace escape probes that might change the kernel memory. So uh, we sent uh, first RFC a few months ago and another one uh, a few days ago. Um, so the main changes uh, between these two are uh, first, uh, initially we only implemented a protection for static uh, kernel memories, so only based on kernel sections, uh, which are kind of defined at good time, thanks to kernel symbols. Um, now we implemented um, a way to track uh, the memory permissions at runtime and be able to kind of reflect these permissions um, to the hypervisor. Uh, for now, there's no more execute the right security policies, um, which we'll get back later. Uh, but uh, we first need to 
the OK with um, the mechanism we, we implemented. Um, we leverage uh, a new patchiwis, uh, which is the pair page attribute patchiwis, uh, which is kind of filling, filling the gap of uh, the move KVM feature, which was to track uh, some uh, guest pages. And also, um, we added a new KVM interface uh, for the VMM to be aware of the request or the dial that the guest might. Um, do and also well um, a way for the guest to know uh, which features um, might be supported what well, are supported by the uh, IPs. So let's see about the KVM implementation. Um, so um, there's a first IP call called log here update, um, which takes three arguments. First one is a control register ID. Second one is a bit flag or of um, masked, well, pinned uh, flags. For instance, in this case, uh, a white position um, bit. And emotional flags again. Um, so, there's two kind of um, VM exits which are implemented. The first one is, well, that can be enabled by the VMM is when the guest uh, ask uh, KVM to enforce a sec such res restriction. And the second one is uh, when the guest try to bypass this um, initial security policy. And in this case, it will get uh, general protection for it. So, a um, bit, bit of explanation about memory permissions. Um, so, uh, with virtual edition, we have the ability to enforce a complementary layer of permissions. Uh, so, on top of the permission that the guest can enforce on itself. Uh, so, this thanks, thanks to um, well, what we call Intel's uh, EPT or second layer address notation or even uh, two dimensional paging. So uh, that is the main feature we're using. And uh, yeah, it is really important to keep in mind that it is a comp complementary layer of, of permissions. So it applies on top of existing kernel permissions. And only the episode can change that. Um, Uh, so that we can actually start the discussion. Uh, yes, yeah, so the idea was to uh, present that for 30 minutes and then up. No. So, so. Okay. Okay. And you can, like, when we discuss, you can show the slides. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway, the slides will be online. Uh, well, they are online. And there are also some demos, some videos. So, you, you can watch them later. Um, so, yeah, in actual, this um, specific article to protect um, for the guest to request protections on, its on memory uh, pages. Um, so there's also the embed implementation, which is to be able to enforce uh, executable memory uh, to be able to split between uh, kernel mode execution and use space mode execution for efficient uh, enforcement. Um, so yeah, the idea is to make to also uh, bring a new API for guests to implement that. Uh, so is our for well, they they're using KVM or either for using other uh, IPs, for instance, uh, IPv. Um, but yeah, they need to share a common goal and also share a test suite and so on. 
Um, for this, we implemented a memory page um, table um, data type, which is a new one, um, to especially deal with um, dynamic kernel uh, memory permission management, so to be able to track all um, the kernel mappings and checked uh, when you got acceptance, it said that it was 40 minutes total of which 10 minutes can be a computation. We were told this two months ago. At this point, uh, I think the problem with uh, HAKI is mostly about uh, how to do the guest side in the So what are the questions that you want from the audience? This is not a conference when you give a demo. If you wanted to give a demo, you had to come to another conference. Like, this should be clear. Like, I don't know okay. what to say. Okay, so, um, well, the main limitations are these ones. I don't want to know the limitations. I want to know what <laughs> questions you want from the audience. Okay. Um, so, well, there's some questions you have. Um, for instance, um, every kernel modifications that are not related, for instance, to kernel module loading, uh, for instance, using F-trace or K-proofs, uh, well, we'd like to be able to know if this kind of change are legitimate or not. And that is, well, something we're not sure to how to implement yet. And, um, and yeah, so the question is, uh, how can we move these patches for what? And, um, yeah, to implement the first step. Um, so the idea would be to first focus on the CRPing patches. Uh, but yeah, there might be other ideas. And uh, yeah, for general review, uh, you'll see tomorrow uh, more general uh, talk on the repeat attack. And um, thank you. So um, any question? Yeah, so since this uh, is the occasion where we have people that are not from the KVN community, uh, do you have uh, some quick explanation about how the guest side works? Because the, the problem is the host side work in KVM is stuff that a lot of people are, uh, from the KVM community have seen and reviewed and is not particularly controversial. I think the more, more important and more complicated part is the guest side where you have uh, issues like you were saying before where uh, write and execute is hard to apply in in Linux because uh, you there's a lot more patching going on than than other kernels such as Windows. Like uh, when you uh, apply a, a KPO, for example, it's there may be other functions running in the same page, and the KPO works by putting a breakpoint on on the instruction, but you cannot really enforce the the write and execute. So you have questions for uh, about especially the implementation on the on the guest side? Yeah, so, um, like, like, I, can you go, for example, through the, the issues that you had with, uh, with between V1 and V2 and why you made the changes? Yeah. It should be, what is it? Okay. Um, so, uh, like um, the static and dynamic memory permissions, do do you is is that something that needs changes uh, in the module loader on or in DPF? Uh, and and also, if you, like you said, we'll get them back on that later. So I suppose you have to say about that. Yeah, uh, I have slide that. Uh, Yeah, here. So yeah, we implemented, we patched mainly the, um, the way they can map uh, pages and uh, change um, some page permissions. So with uh, vmap, um, set memory x instance and textbook. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, set of, so for instance, when the kernel maps kernel memory, 
um, maps a PN module. So we, in theory, we have everything to be able to check uh, the signature of this, at least the executable pages. So that should be okay. Um, but uh, when there's, for instance, if trace or uh, K probes, which are uh, which change the kernel memory, um, the question is, how do we know if these kind of changes are legitimate or not? So can we get a um, kind of a pattern of a set of changes that might make sense? Or um, yeah, can how can we can restrict this kind of changes uh, in a way that will not harm too much uh, the gas kernel? So yeah, these are open questions. Um, but eBPF, um, well, there's currently no way to check uh, program signature. So that is a really big issue too. Uh, we cannot, um, well, the app is, uh, has no way to check if a GPF program, a loaded one, is legitimate or not. So, um, yeah, there were some proposals to implement um, BIF program signatures, but uh, nothing upstream yet. So I'm, I'm still starting to understand what we are trying to protect against for real. So um, the, the main thing you're doing with uh, this hypervisor-based security is to protect the kernel from modifying itself, correct? Yeah. Okay. So if the kernel were to map itself, its text section, and the kernel maps its page tables of the, of the fixed map as read-only, and then only has a small trampoline, which is the same thing you have right now with the hypercalls, a small trampoline to actually go and modify its own page tables, for example, yeah. in the cases where you need to, you could probably get 90% of what you're doing here without doing any hypervisor at all. Yeah, but um, when it is dynamic, I mean, at one time, um, the idea is that the kernel might already be compromised. But if the kernel is compromised, the kernel can call the hypercall that says, uh, yeah. I want to write to this now. That's why we need uh, to be able to authenticate these changes. You do what? We, ne we need to, be, to have a way to authenticate these new permissions, the data which uh, might get uh, executable permissions. So uh, we have actually everything we need for module loading, for instance, because we can sign module and the hypervisor or the VMM, uh, for instance, could get the signature and be sure that it is uh, legitimate and then let the kernel use this new memory, this new data and make them executable. Um, but yeah, the idea is to kind of delegate the trust to something um, outside of the gas kernel itself. I still don't don't fully get why why you really do need all of that. Um, like I think I think getting us a ninety percent solution that just works everywhere is going to be much nicer than a twenty percent solution that is going to need a lot of adjustments in the, in the whole stack, right? So um, if you if you're saying you need an authenticated path, that authenticated path can be part of Linux, right? The module is already part of Linux, and then you just need to find a way. Like the, the thing you're concerned about is things like rock chains or arbitrary memory modifications of, I don't know, something, not sure what actually. Um, so as long as you can't modify your text and your text always goes to the same path to validate that the code it's trying to modify is signed, I, I even with everything in the same context, I don't see a way how you would easily, at least, without a complete disastrous security issue, um, circumvent it. And that, again, gives us 90%. Yeah, okay, so um, that's a good point. Um, but all this kind of uh, control flow is, well, uh, kind of uh, comes from state data, and this might change over time. So uh, even if you're using um, kind of helper to change uh, memory protection, uh, this could also be used by attackers. Um, they can call any kind of code, 
right. jump to any kind of code functions, uh, do some work, whatever. So um, yeah, the idea is for well, attackers could execute all these kind of memory permission changes requests. Sure, then you have CFI and you yeah. do at your at, at some operations to your compilers or even just to do parameter checks to make sure that the blockchain doesn't know the secrets you have to handle hand over between your your actual safe chain i think i think they're just much more easier ways and then once you have that and the kernel is self-protecting then you can start moving pieces out to the hypervisor in order to even increase that protection oh yeah but i think it's we're starting at step two before we're doing step one no no, no. Can go, i mean the kernel self-protection features including cfi and such feature are uh, kind of a prerequisite. We need to have that to, but this is a step forward. It is an improvement of the current situation. But we mark the fixed map as read only for kernel maps. Yes. What is your concern then with modifying that? We do mark the fixed map on read only for the page table with that back to the map. Well, we can. If you can change the uh, text of the kernel, you can execute like anything, right? I think the question is what can you, what logic can you do in the VMM that you can't do in a protected part of the kernel? So, um, the main point is, um, that, at some point, the kernel can become malicious. But uh, the idea is to kind of limit uh, what this kernel can do. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, so like you have you have a magic hyper call that lets you change permissions. The decision to allow or disallow has to have some magic sauce to it. Why can't you put that magic sauce in the guest but protect that region of guest memory so that you have integrity of your decision making within the guest. Okay. And then you don't have to believe anything out to the host. Yeah, that's so if I understand clearly, so you're suggesting to kind of put the verification mechanism, at least the ver verification code, into the guest. But we need to have some data or something to what well, I agree that we need the hypothesis to do this check, this verification. Well, why can't that be done? Like, what's so special about that? The IPSO is more privileged. It... So I think um, maybe one way of looking at this is thinking of it in terms of how many places are there in the kernel that could perform operations that could potentially affect the page tables? And can we implement perfect CFI there? And if the answer is we can implement good CFI, but not perfect CFI, then arguably having this in the hypervisor allows us to have a, a sort of more constrained set of entry points for these modifications. And it's a more straightforward problem to do that in a space where the attacker has no ability to influence what's happening there other than call into it. Part I'm missing though is if you were bouncing out to the hypervisor, there has to be a hyper call. There has to be something to get you out to the hypervisor. That something has to, I mean, it's going to be a dumb pipe or it's going to be smart. If you make it smart, why not make it smart enough to just make all the decisions itself? Because you can protect what it's running from. Like at that point, is it just a data issue where you have more data in the VMM to make the smart decisions and then you don't want to shove that into guest? That's the part I'm not catching. There's one thing I can think of that the hypervisor gives you uh, is a guarantee of logging and measurement. So you you do have the ability with this to have an accurate log and measurement of all the modifications that were made, which means at least you get a bit of post-mortem ability or auditing ability, or in some case, uh, you know, verification. That, that's one aspect. I think. But I mean, the logging thing, then you have a pipe to just send out your stuff off the, off the guest. Like, yeah, the guest and it's for, like a rat hole. So one thing that I could see this happening is like 
okay, CR pinning is nice. Uh, memory permissions are important, but the way that you could do it in, in Linux, if you have uh, this kind of enlightened guest, would be to delegate the patching to the host in a way where you tell the host the possible patching alternatives before you, you can be compromised. Like, I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm saying that uh, it, at least, uh, like, it, it tells you this is something that the hypervisor could do in advance. Or even, like, mm, I, I think there's maybe even more uh, benefit from just protecting some data and making sure that that data cannot be written than uh, actually in uh, even in the executable protection in some sense because let's say all the alternative stable all the jump jump key static key uh, patching tables if uh, you you can modify those uh, you could then trigger some kind of uh, uh, some kind of text uh, kernel text uh, over overwrite in a way that can be easier to to sneak in like you you first sneak in some change elsewhere and then you actually perform the change i don't know if this is okay so um <clears throat> one of the <clears throat> one of the principles here is that there is a um, security boundary between the hypervisor and the kernel and so what this does is tries to utilize uh, the security boundary and put um, uh, security policy and decisions uh, in the hypervisor so that by principle, uh, an attack on the kernel uh, is not easily able to uh, modify that. And so this is the same as like when you have user space, you could make a lot of arguments that user space should do all of its own security and, and resource management and and but the, we we have a security boundary between the kernel, so it's not an either or thing. And we want as much hardening in the normal system as possible. There's already projects around this, the um, the KSPP project and and uh, others. So this is more about utilizing a security boundary to to um, kind of deterministically or more deterministically uh, block certain classes of attacks, which we don't necessarily know about. Um, so I, I think anything that we can do in user land should also be done um, as a, a yeah from a layering a layered security approach. So just to add to what James was saying, so, so I think as soon as a policy, because you, you you haven't emphasized you were talking about a hypercourse which is going to change the policy, but if you can minimize that and pre-provision the policy into the trusted hypervisor. Then, and, and, and maybe some just leave out some things like, you know, like JIT and stuff even out of picture for now. So just let that be writable and things like that. So, so, so to minimize the policy changes, then, you know, the pre-provision policy to hypervisor can protect much more. <laughs> and when we like, you know, it's, it's little transitions you, ha you can have between the, you know, what guest is asking to do. I think there is value on that. So also, um, I'm a little less pessimistic than some of you in terms of the value this brings to the kernel, as you may have noticed. But I think it's also worth remembering that this sort of infrastructure, where it has been deployed elsewhere, is not has not just been used for the purposes of kernel protection. Having this sort of scenario means that you also have the ability to have additional guest hypervisors, uh, sorry, VMs alongside the main one. And the hypervisor is then effectively a strong boundary, such that if there is a kernel arbitrary read primitive, then this may not block that at the kernel level, but if we can move all the credentials out of that kernel into a separate VM, then this hypervisor is now enforcing a meaningful security boundary there. And that is something that we can't just do by fiddling around with the yeah, kernel there itself. Are there ways to do that? Yeah, there are way better ways to do that. And I think that's what Paulo was getting at very early on of the guest changes for this are what are more controversial from the KVM side. None of this is scary. It's not complex considering all the other stuff. But when you're talking about, I'm sliding up there, all the K probes and all the patching that goes on in the kernel, figuring out when that's safe and when that's not safe. And that's going to be like, if you're trying to upstream this, that's going to be your long pole by a huge margin. 
I'll ask a very simple question. Like when you say set memory X has to be tracked, how do you know that that's a good one versus a bad one? Because you're going to allow them somehow. Yeah. How do you know that? Um, you can you can patch it, right? But how do you know when you reach that point, whether it's the, the valid case or the bad one? Yeah. yeah. It's also what Elena was saying. Uh, like there is value there is value in putting a security policy but what is the security policy like i made a stupid suggestion of putting the alternative tables the alternative tables are a kind of security policy so this is what uh, what we need to 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 do first like start from what she said and say what is uh, the security sensitive thing that you want to move in the hypervisor and what's the additional protection that you get from there <laughs> to the point about the, the concern about what complexity we're adding to the hypervisor to implement the security policy, if we have the ability to irrevocably set permissions on pages, uh, we can make an, sort of an unpatchable region of kernel text where we can actually delegate the policy to the guest, right? The guest has whatever logic says th these are valid ways to patch the kernel or whatever the authentication necessary is to, to say this is okay to to set the permissions, and then we then you lock down, you know, those pages are read-only irrevocably, and then that becomes sort of your your policy that you, you set up inside the guest, and that then you don't have to worry on the hypervisor side about that policy being different for different kinds of guests, or or how to how to send that policy to the to the hypervisor. You say only that unpatchable region of kernel text is then allowed to set these permissions for other parts of the the address space. Okay, but that's still a policy, right? What yeah, is, yeah. What is the workable policy that you can do in there to say that, you know, this page will never have a bit of DTFX? I mean, pages that come out of that state, right? Um, they're obviously in the green, so you can't. I don't know what policy would do. We have a lot of static pages. I mean, what pages are not going to change? Look, that's the easy side, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, so, I'm talking about static pages. It's a content static page. All right, I think we are one minute away from time. I think the I mean, oh, we had some oh, yeah, buffer. Great. We can go over. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, just summarizing, even though we have a little bit of buffer, but it does sound like we got to sort out what the guest side is going to be and how the policy is going to work. Because again, I mean, just beating that horse, the KVM side, not scary. But like, as you saw from like Peter Zilstra's responses yeah. to the few patches yesterday, I think people don't see the picture. Yeah. And, uh, it's you're not going to get uh, constructive feedback. <laughs> you get people just yelling at you. So one thing uh, I think uh, I've been thinking, I, I'm pretty new to Linux. Uh, on Windows side, there has been things like, you know, aliasing attacks. So how does this protect against like aliasing attacks where you can just map a linear address to a different GPA? Yeah, so that's why we have a new data structure, which is... Um, is this one somewhere? Uh, so we have a kind of a, we use counters uh, to yeah this one to track the mapping and kind of reflect uh, what the hardware does and keep that in sync to know uh, if there's multiple pages physical pages which are mapped multiple times uh, with different permissions and what well, in this case because we need we want this to to work of course. Uh, well, we get the union of these permissions, and that's it. We, we have the minimal required permissions. Uh, if at some point um, these pages uh, are only mapped in a read-only way, for instance, uh, we'll be able to not allow uh, read-write mapping. I can just write page tables to point a linear address to a different physical address, right? Yeah, that's... Um, so how are you mapping. checking that? Yeah, but you also need to, to set permissions. And here, to, one thing to keep in mind is that this, uh, well, the mapping, which is handled by the guest kernel, and this first layer of permissions for this mapping, and another layer set of permissions uh, handled by the IPSO, uh and by the EPT, uh, CPU feature is only on the physical pages. So on this layer, we can enforce permissions and yeah, it. So, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, it's more of a, of a comment just on the policy side. So this is a separate work stream that we're engaging with. There's a talk tomorrow more generally on this project. Um, but the policy, so the idea, the expectation would be that there would be a, like a secure boot. And as part of that, there would be a um, HECI policy would be loaded, which would be independent. So this is not something that would be hard coded. Uh, and currently we're using the, we're parsing the, um, the kernel map to get mappings um, and, and at boot so that we know ahead of time. Uh, on the static side of things, the dynamic side is is more complex. But uh, just to mention, yeah, the, the policy side is a is a ongoing development. Yeah, so I, I think we can wrap up. Uh, okay, it was the first KVM session ever, so some uh, uh, <laughs> screw ups <laughs> were kind of expected, but I think in the end it got a lot more productive. So thanks to everybody that participated and uh, we can move on to the next uh, session. Thank, Thank you. you. Michael. <laughs>